the sun was always a god. To the Greeks, he was the titan Helios, who rose each morning in his golden house, donned a shimmering crown, and drove his winged steeds over the Ark of Heaven. To the Romans, he was simply Sol, worshipped since time immemorial as the source of warmth and light. Although the Romans, like the Greeks, came to associate the sun with Apollo, they continued to worship Sol at modest sanctuaries scattered throughout the city. Augustus dedicated two Egyptian obelisks to the sun, and Vespasian added a solar crown to the Colossus of Nero. Sol, however, remained a minor god. During the second century, Mithras, a new solar deity, appeared. Mithraism was founded on small cells of male worshippers who met for ritual meals in cave-like sanctuaries dominated by an image of Mithras slaying the primordial bull. The cult made extensive use of cosmic symbolism. The seven grades of initiation were associated with the seven planets, and the signs of the zodiac often appeared on the ceilings of sanctuaries. Mithras was often depicted feasting with the sun god. Inscriptions addressed Mithras himself as the sun, Sol Invictus Mithras. The Syrian sun god Elagabal arrived in Rome during the brief and disastrous reign of Elagabalus. An elaborate sanctuary was built on the Palatine Hill, and the conical black meteorite that served as the god's image was paraded through the streets of Rome in a jeweled chariot. When Elagabalus was assassinated, however, the cult died with him. Through the stormy careers of Mithras and Elagabal, the old Roman god Sol was revered in his traditional sanctuaries. Over the course of the 3rd century, he gained the title Invictus, unconquered. This does not seem to have signified a change in how the god was conceptualized. It was just an epithet, originally applied to Jupiter and Hercules, and never exclusively associated with the sun. The significance of Sol Invictus in Roman religious life was enhanced by the Emperor Aurelian, who elevated the priests of the sun to the rank of pontifex, founded a major festival, and constructed an opulent new temple for the god. It used to be thought that the Sol Invictus worshipped in Aurelian's magnificent sanctuary was a new god imported from Syria, and that Aurelian sought to establish Sol as the dominant god of the Roman pantheon. This theory would make Aurelian the Roman equivalent of Akhenaten, the heretic pharaoh who made the sun god Aten supreme over all the other gods of Egypt. Most scholars now believe, however, that Sol Invictus was the traditional Roman god Sol, elevated to greater prominence by the personal devotion of the emperor. There is no evidence that Aurelian regarded Sol as anything more than a personal patron, He may have been following the precedent of Augustus, who had associated himself with the sun god Apollo. The emperors of the Tetrarchic period, following Aurelian's example, revered Sol Invictus. So did the young Constantine. For nearly two decades, in fact, Constantine would issue coins bearing the likeness of the sun. This issue, struck around the year 315, is typical. The reverse shows Sol Invictus with the globe of the world in his left hand and the radiant crown of the sun on his head. The legend reads, Soli Invicto Comiti, that is, to the unconquered sun, companion of the emperor. I have an example of the same coin in my own collection, sent to me by my friend Kevin at Noble Roman Coins. Noble Roman Coins presents what are, in my experience, the best uncleaned Roman coins on the market. Their premium uncleaned coins, like those pictured here, routinely sell out almost as soon as they're listed. Sign up on the NRC homepage to be notified when a new lot arrives. Noble Roman Coins also sells high-quality cleaned coins at very competitive prices, such as this spectacular denarius of Severus Alexander, which features Sol on the reverse. In addition to coins, Noble Roman Coins sells cleaning tools, an award-winning guide to cleaning ancient coins, and an impressive assortment of Roman artifacts, like this extremely rare amulet shaped like the head of Mithras. 
to explore Noble Roman Coins' catalog of Roman coins and artifacts and sign up for the next batch of Uncleaned Coins, check out their website, which is linked in the description. Returning to our topic, following the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, Constantine associated himself ever more closely with Christianity. But for more than a decade after his conversion, Sol Invictus continued to appear on his coins. Some scholars have suggested that Constantine assimilated Sol Invictus to the Christian god. A mosaic of the period from the Vatican necropolis, which appears to show Jesus with the attributes of Sol Invictus, suggests that other Christians may have made such borrowings. The cult of Sol Invictus remained prominent well into the 4th century. Julian the Apostate wrote a long hymn in which he proclaimed himself a subject of the Lord's Son, whom he praised as the supreme God. Many leading senators served as pontiffs of Sol. It used to be thought that the solar cults of late antiquity were serious rivals of Christianity. This was most often said of Mithraism, which included elements, such as a sacramental meal, reminiscent of Christianity. Early Christian authors, for their part, dismissed Mithraism's communion rite as satanic plagiarism and mocked its devotees for worshipping the sun in dark caves. Neither Mithraism nor the cult of Sol Invictus was ever likely to transform the spiritual life of the Roman Empire in the way Christianity did. Both were relatively limited in their appeal, and neither set itself in opposition to traditional polytheism. The cult of the sun, however, left a lasting impression. The day of the sun's nativity, celebrated at Rome on December 25th, may have determined the date of Christmas, though the evidence is ambiguous. And it may have been the lingering influence of the solar cult that led Constantine to decree that Sunday, the sacred day of Sol, should be the day of worship and rest throughout the Roman Empire. My new book, Insane Emperors, Sunken Cities, and Earthquake Machines, is now available as a paperback, ebook, and audiobook. You can buy your copy through Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or your local bookstore. For more Told & Stone content, check out my channels, Told & Stone Footnotes, and Scenic Routes to the Past, which are linked in the description. Please consider joining other viewers in supporting Told & Stone on Patreon. Thanks for watching.